Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. My cousin did something really horrible when he was young. I'm not going to go into the details. But he's been in prison for 15 years and in that time, he's met some very strange people. He's got his own little cabal of guys who stick together for safety. It's not a particularly harsh prison, but that's just how it is. I'm sure most of you know. Well, he and I keep in touch and he's been telling me about this one old guy. Not too old, but he's older. Says he's in for 30 to life. He's an odd dude, and he has this habit of drawing weird things everywhere. He says he's trying to escape, somehow. But his cellmate says he isn't carving into the walls or anything noticeable. This old guy used to be a building inspector in Chicago. Most of his stories involve finding dead bodies stuffed away in Prohibition-era tunnels and things like that. But the single story that my cousin wanted to relate to me was particularly strange. It's the most lucid story he's been able to get out of him by far. I get called in one day. Boss is talking about how the power company wants to set up some new lines in an old area of town. So, we take the work truck down there and it's this cluster of rotting buildings on the edge of the city. There's a crew cleaning up in one of these old buildings. Removing industrial debris. Whitewashing graffiti, things like that. They're working from the upper floors down. And all the big garbage has been moved out already. They've even got a bin for all the needles and shit they're finding. They have separate bins for the weird books and paper they're finding everywhere. City just wants it hauled off to the dump. There's still a bunch of graffiti everywhere. And they're in a bunch of weird, neon spiral designs on the floors with some lines poking out of them. The wretched homeless, man. Some of the guys with industrial spray cleaners can't get that off the floor. Get sent into these ground tunnels that were meant to relieve foot traffic on the streets back in the day. Companies think they can go around hiring dig teams by setting up cable and power wires through these tunnels. So the city has us inspecting the place. I'm sure this would also cut down on the labor it would take to repair damages. Seems economical. Smells damper than a dog in heat down there. Wearing a respirator in case of black mold. My job is to check for structural. Foundation damage. Mold. The bad things that can get people hurt. Go through this archway in the lobby and the stairs take me to this long, dark tunnel. It's not too long, though. You can see the stairs to the next building right there. And the crew set up industrial lights, so it isn't creepy or anything. Police have also swept this whole place top to bottom. So I'm almost certain we're not gonna run into some meth addict defending his sacred hole. Almost certain. There's this archway that leads to an adjacent old apartment complex on the right side of the tunnel. Small staircase has a couple offset craters in it. Which is weird, but not bad enough to warrant serious foundational damage. They lead to another. Longer tunnel which is also lit up with industrial lights. Checking around for cracks, signs of leaks. This place is surprisingly intact for such an old building. Notice a small door halfway peeking out on the left side of the tunnel. Small staircase in front of it. So it's sort of a tight fit. Doors locked. So we just start writing up everything in the surrounding T-shaped tunnel. Guys are taking a while opening it. It's a really sturdy door. They end up having to beat the door down. And even that doesn't work. Here they even broke a circular saw trying to cut through the lock. They eventually break it down. And someone comes to get me from inspecting the lobby area to check the place out. Smells like hot sewage in there, man. It's dark. But the guys bring in another industrial light in and it's this small room with a couple more doors immediately opposite the entrance door. The place is obviously a weird homeless encampment. But there's nobody in there. No needles or pipes or anything, surprisingly. There's some blankets where I suppose the person here was sleeping. There's also a wooden desk in front of a metal stool. And the things covered in books and newspapers and pens. Lots of cigarette butts in this big ashtray. And an old kerosene lantern. There's some boxes in the corner near the desk. One of the guys goes into it and finds a couple rat skeletons. And a lot of cans. Most of the labels are too worn to read. But there's one can of drummer boy sardines and a couple cans that look like spam. Belongs in the trash .jpg. I open the door to the right and it's a functioning bathroom. Or at least it probably was back in the day. Complete with a sink and toilet. And this one clear area that I assume they used to bathe on with a grate on the ground for water disposal. There's some minor cracking on the floor. 
indicating foundation damage from water. And I mark that down. There's an old toothbrush and a bar of soap in the corner. I freak out because my foot knocks over an old bucket. But there's just an old rag inside. One guy in the living area says there's a newspaper about the Korean War. Nice find. He takes the newspapers because he's a nerd who likes saving that kind of stuff. Move on to the next door. Locked as well. They don't waste time with the saw and just start beating the thing. And it breaks apart. This door wasn't metal like the last one. So it just falls apart. Now, this room is cavernous. When the cloud of dust settles, the other guys bring in more flood lamps and it's this big sort of meeting room with a bunch of folding chairs and even a couple bunk beds in the corner. Immediately to the left, there's this big spiral graffiti thing in the center of the wall and a podium offset from that facing all the folding chairs. I'm almost certain we've stumbled into some Satanist cult thing at this point. A few of the workers pull out some cross necklaces while they work. You know, just in case. Sheets on the beds look like they were used, but the layer of dust tells me it's been a while. More kerosene lanterns. And we find a closet in the back chock full of books. Like, old, old books. And most of them look half burnt. The boys get to clearing up the folding chairs and a couple guys take apart the bed and remove that. I check around the big room for structural damage. But there's nothing. The place is really, really sturdy for an old building. Usually you see more cracks in the floor than this. And it's fine because they're old buildings, but the place is immaculate with the exception of the dust and old things. I don't want to start reading these books because my boss is going around the place, talking about how long this is going to take to clear out. I tell the boys to move the books into a separate bin for me to inspect later. There's a smaller book on the podium, which I start looking through. First few pages are completely worn through and illegible. The rest is in heavy, heavy cursive. But whoever was writing this was suspiciously literate for a homeless weirdo living in a basement with a bunch of dudes. Okay. So this is definitively a Satanist cult or something like that. Flip through the pages and there's a bunch of pictures and drawings. One page is dojered and it's that spiral design again. There's two numbered lines pointing to specific points on the spiral. But they aren't like one, two, three. It starts from seven at the starting point and eight, pointing toward the center. There's a little caption just under the picture detailing it. But like I said, I can't read the handwriting. Public education hard at work for you. I'm still a little weirded out considering the fact that the first door had no ostensible lock on the outside, meaning it could only be locked from the inside. I'm assuming there's either another entrance somewhere, or whoever was working here is still here. There's still two doors on the right side of the room across from the living area, and we haven't opened those yet. So I'm assuming there may be an exit that way. First door is open. And it's another closet. Now, opening this door freaks me out because it's full of those spiral designs with lines poking out from various parts of the spiral outward. These aren't spray painted or anything, neither. They're carved into the concrete. It looks like there had been shelves here at one point, because there's flat marks where they should have been and some holes where some nodes had been to hold them in place. There's also an old leather jacket on the ground. I pick it up and check the pockets and there's nothing. Boss starts complaining to me about how I'm not an investigator. Except I technically am, just not that kind of investigator. Begin doing my job around the areas we've cleared out. And the workmen vacate once the place is cleared. They obviously don't want to spend more time in there than they're paid to. The place is giving me creeps, too. And here's where the first weird thing happens. I turn around to exit the closet. And the whole room is switched around. Like, I was on the right side of the room at first. And then I exited the closet on the left side. Given, they had just removed everything and it was dark. So maybe I was remembering things wrong. But I swear on my life. The room was flipped. Now, the big spiral was on the left wall whereas it should have been on the right. A couple boys come in to take away the podium. A small bottle of whiskey falls out and they look at each other like score. Don't know what happened with that bottle. But whatever because I left immediately. Everything was normal, except not. Like, it was all reversed. I exit through the door they took forever opening. And now I'm on the right side of the tunnel instead of the left. Just walk outside because I think I'm going crazy. Boss is out there. Starts asking me what's up. I tell him and he says I'm just weirded out from being underground for several hours. He has me take my break and I sit down for a sandwich and a smoke. No. 
There was one part before he trailed off into incoherent mumbling. It's actually freaky. And I'm going to talk to him again tomorrow, so I'll tell you what I hear back from the guy. Because he says he'll ask the old man more. So, I finish my break and go back in. I come back to the door and it's still on the right. Except this time it's a little further. And I can tell because when I enter, it's further from the desk than it had been. Don't think about it because the other guys come in and say that they gotta get the desk out of there. I take some workmen to the back and try opening that other door we didn't open. It's locked again, but they rattle it around a bit and the wooden door just breaks. Now, this is truly a big find. I can hear the noise of breaking door bouncing off all the walls. And I know it's a big, big room. Tell the boys we've got something and they come in with the flood lamps. They light up the place and it's this big storage area with double doors at the end. There's this massive hole in the ground, and I can see water flowing from a small broken pipe into the hole. There's even damage in the ceiling. What the hell? Start writing this up. My boss walks in and just sighs and puts his face into his hands. He says he has to make a call and tells us to just start cleaning up the place while he heads to a phone booth. Clean up what? There's not anything in here except what I assume was explosion damage. Look into the hole. It's a good 10 meters around, and a big circle with chunks taken out at all directions. It looks like there's an adjacent tunnel connected to it, but it's made with brick and not concrete. The hole continues down. I hawk a loogie into it and don't even hear a drop. Then again, there was the sound of constantly flowing water. So I couldn't tell. The water is flowing into the hole. But I can't hear it splash anywhere. One of the boys shines a flood lamp and it definitely looks like there's a bottom. I can't tell you how far down this thing went. But I'm assuming the water was going somewhere for it not to have flooded the place by this point. I can faintly see another pipe gushing water out at the side of the hole way at the bottom. He just started mumbling like an idiot here. So I don't know. My cousin says the rest of them are interested in the story. So they were gonna try to get him to tell more of it. I don't know if they'll get it out of him, though. What with him being busy drawing on the walls and talking to himself and all that, really gives me confidence in our prison system. All right, boys. I'm back with some more information. On a side note, my cousin is being considered by the parole board. Yay. Everybody get happy for my cousin, yay. Maybe he'll make something of himself. All right. So all of this information comes through the old man's cellmate. Surprisingly. He was a doctor and he had his own little prognosis about the old man's condition. He doesn't think he's schizophrenic or anything. He actually thinks the man's been through a serious traumatic experience that caused him to get this way. Now, this sort of matches up with what he's in for. But it doesn't sound like it's connected to the whole spiral thing. He was actually convicted for killing his wife, who he says he was married to for eight years. He denies ever doing it. And he probably denied it to the court despite a bunch of evidence, so they just threw his ass away. Anyway, the doctor prisoner says that the old man kept telling him that he walked into his house. And he found his handgun on the counter. When he went to put it back in the lockbox, he found his wife shot to death in their bedroom. Now, you can buy that, but given his mental state, I'm not sure what is and isn't like. Besides, everybody says they're innocent. But the story gets weirder from there and way more far-fetched. It keeps pointing the blame to these men in black or some shady group or something. This actually does tie back into the story about the spiral things and, despite how bullshit it sounds, it does sort of make sense. After we found this big asshole in the storage room with the double doors, the place was taped off. All repair work was quickly cut off on the same day. After I turned in my report, my boss tells me that the city was beginning to figure out what to do with the place. Anybody would expect for this to result in just one big demolition project. I went back to the place in my free time in the weekend after, and the place was fenced off with warnings about how the building was unstable. This is where I met Saul, who was the security guy at the place. Saul was a little bit dumb. The kind of guy that just does his job, goes to the bar at exactly seven, drinks exactly three beers, exclusively talks about football, and goes to bed at exactly ten. The kind of guy who listens to anybody who purports themselves as an authority figure for good boy points. I strike up a conversation with the guy and he now thinks I'm some serious inspector, which is partially true. I show him my pass from the other day and he says that he was sure that inspections were done for the day. He says some white-collar guys were standing around with a permit from the city to check the place out when he got there at 6. He specifically mentioned that he thought they were cops or something, considering they were packing heat. 
They entered and told him not to go in with them and to watch the gate. He says that they actually just left. And it was like five in the afternoon by now. Yay, keep going. Also, did you by any chance get a drawing or something of the spiral thingy? No, apparently he only ever draws things on the walls of his cell. And the prison had him thrown in the hole for it a bunch so he always wipes it off at the end of the day. Doctor even says he'll be sitting there with a cup of water or a tiny rock or something, drawing on the wall. Anyway, this is all he's told the doc to shut him up about the drawings, which I'm getting a little more insight into now. Still, I think the guy's nuts and that he killed his wife and he's trying to get himself into a cushy mental ward. So, he lets me in the place and everything the crew was working with was still there. I start flipping through some of the books and it's all really weird. A lot of these books involved complicated calculus and physics. Most of the newer books had tags from the University of Chicago. And one book on theoretical physics was heavily noted in and dojered everywhere. I decided I wanted to keep these, so to make it believable to Saul. I told him I was supposed to get the whole book box out of there in my truck. I decided to leave that for later and I told him to accompany me to the back area where the hole is. He starts whining about how he should really be looking after the gate and that this isn't his job and goes on. So, I go back to the tunnel where the door is and it's on the left again. Apparently, they've moved out everything they could, except the big desk which doesn't look like it could fit through the door. Can you get a reproduction of the spiral from the doctor or your cousin? I assume the doctor at least saw it. I've already put in the request with my cousin. I should be able to get a rough drawing of it. If the guards will let him draw something or if I can get my cousin to somehow trace it out. But they don't let the prisoners mess with pens or pencils for obvious reasons. Still, in the meeting room, I think I can arrange something with the guards and they'll let him. So we're working on that. I won't be seeing him again for a while, though. So I may have to make a follow-up thread for this. I use my flashlight and the bed rags are gone. The chairs are gone. The toothbrush and bucket are gone. Even the doors are gone. All of them have been taken off the hinges. And the ones that broke apart are obviously gone. I checked for the burn books from the back closet and those are gone, too. The podium is gone. Even the dust is gone. And there's wipe marks everywhere and the place smells like bleach. There is some new shit, though. That I wasn't expecting, like industrial lights everywhere. The spiral is carved into the walls and painted everywhere are still there. But I can see scratch marks like someone was messing with them. And there's number cards everywhere like it was a police investigation. Starting to think they found a body in here that I didn't. What's weird is that there's these buckets of plaster neatly organized in the corner. Like they're coming back to fix the place or something. Weird for a police investigation, right? And that closet that had all the spirals and it looks like they used a bomb to break it up. Chunks of cement are taken out of it. And it's all in a pile next to the door along with some bags of cement. Some pickaxes and other construction. I finally find a switch on one of the wires and I hit it. It takes a second for the room to light up. And I hear Saul ask if I hit the lights. Pop out for a second to talk with him assure the guy everything's fine. So, I head back in and check the door in the tunnel. Yeah, exactly where I left it. I start walking in and I stop for a second because I thought I remembered there being stairs in front of it. Just blow it off. But in hindsight there were definitely stairs there and that still freaks me out fall down and hit my head on the desk. Okay, now the stairs are inside the room, what the hell? The doctor says he goes over this one specific part of the story over and over again, and gets real nervous when he talks about it. He says he might have actually gotten brain damage from this, but I think this is just talk. Saul comes in and asks if I'm okay, and I thank him for insisting that I wear a helmet. He comes with me this time, and he starts asking me what the city is doing in here start bullshitting about repairs and the power company and other things like that. Saul says he hears something in the back and they head into the old storage room. Now, Saul just starts spurging out a bit, looking into the hole and being like what the hell happened here. He's like Uo, that's where the water sound was coming from. I keep to myself that this guy's sort of a moron, but like a likable moron. Okay, I'm gonna keep going with the story and I don't care how bull you think it is. But I'm finishing what I started. Buy it. Stick around for the entertainment value. Or screw off. I don't care. If I'm making a conjecture. I'll let you know. But right now I'm just going off of my notes about the guy. If people here care enough. Maybe I'll ask to look through the public files about this. 
maybe, but right now, just accept that all of this is word of mouth. So. The guy says he's in the big room with Saul gaping at the hole. No pun intended. He shines his flashlight down there and nothing's changed. Little pipe bleeding water out into this thing. And a big pipe down there gushing water. And there's the brick tunnel just under the floor they're standing on. That's when he notices that there's a new folding table and a few chairs on the side of the room now. It looks like the guys who were here were doing some kind of paperwork on the hole right there. Desk has a typewriter. A lamp connected to the power cord and a bunch of untouched paper. There's also some other equipment. A lot of things he didn't know what to make of. Next to the hole. There's this big pile of rope and metal bars and they figure out that it's a ladder that's already stuck on some nodes that are bolted into the floor. What really freaked him out was the door, though. This is where the old man gets frantic and starts raving about men in black, says they know something about this. Probably as much as the people who were screwing with it in the first place. Now, we left this door wide open. I noticed that there's a lot of construction equipment next to the door. They've broken into the ground and are using these new holes to prop up these big steel support beams that are holding the door shut. They're definitely new. Because the cardboard for them is sitting right there by the door. These beams are bolted to the door. And there's more. Door's got three new sets of shiny chains. Even thicker than the last ones, and they're more organized this time. There's these holding circles drilled into the wall around the door supporting the chains. And there's three massive padlocks holding them tight. Top down in a straight line. Saul's already at the thing with the bottom padlock. I really don't want to go near the thing because this seems like a real bad sign. But Saul's over there mumbling something. When I ask him what's up, he says that he's reading them. Reading padlocks. What, like where they were made. He tells me that they've got Latin on them goes on to explain that he's from a Catholic school and they'd been teaching him Latin since he was a kid. Sorry this took a while. But please bear with me here because I did some digging. Cousin's not the most intelligent guy out there, of course. And all he could give me about this part was he says something like communion bow come elect us. I owe rum, the weirdo. I actually sat there asking about this and that's the closest we got to what he actually told them it said. Dude swears by it. Old dude says that's all Saul could read. Now, I'm gonna be the Mary Sue here and say that they got rid of the Chinese course in my high school during freshman year and I actually took Latin for three years instead, on the whim of my parents because they were all like it's part of a classical education. The Monty Python guys knew Latin. Given, it's been years and I hardly remember anything, but I know that he definitely meant come elect us rum. I definitely just found it in a Google search. And it's the tail end of a psalm in the Bible. So, yeah. I'm sitting here laughing now because, according to what I'm looking at, the Vatican are in Chicago now. This dumb story has got me jittery and I want to know more. And I debated putting this here because it sounds like horse shit. Like yeah of course it's the Bible. Here's the bit I think he's talking about, though. Psalm 140 to 4 non declines cormium and verba militiae ad excusandas excusations and peccatis come hominibus operantibus iniquitatum et non communicabo cum electis air. English. Do not turn aside my heart to words of malice, to making excuses for sin, with men who work iniquity, and I will not communicate, even with the best of them. Of course, he didn't have the benefit of Google in the late 80s or whenever they were using typewriters. So he goes on. Saul looks at me and says that the last part says communicabo cum electis air. I see some word that looks like malignant and he's getting worried. Now, he wants go directly to the exit. And I want to go to the exit. Not because he's creeped out, but because he's supposed to be watching the gate. Like I said, total moron. I'm about to go and I notice a camera sitting on the folding desk. I decide to go ahead and snag the film while Saul stands around looking at the hole. I open it and he asks me what I'm doing when the thing makes a loud click. Masterfully bullshit something to him and he buys it. We go ahead and leave. And I'm walking out when he remembers that the lights are on. Decide to help him out with the flashlight while he hits the lights. He hits them, and we leave. That stupid door with the stairs still has the stairs inside the room like we left them. He helps me load the books in the truck and I ask him when those guys are coming back. He looks at me weird and says that he thought I knew. Tell him I'll just ask them tonight and drive off. Tip him a 20 and he smiles real big and thanks me. On the way back, I stop at a film place and pay to get the photos developed. Drive home. I park my truck in the driveway and my wife comes out to greet me, asks me what's up with the books. Explain all the weird stuff at work and she takes an interest, too. 
starts helping me move the books into my office. She's sort of complaining about how I should really be focusing on work or how I can get in trouble. Just tell her that this is part of the job, and we have dinner. She's watching the news and I decide to go through the books. There's a lot of books on theoretical physics here, and almost all of them are from libraries or the university. The oldest one is this book with some burn damage that covers chemistry and transmutation, in really worn type. It says Young Men's Association, Chicago Library. The doctor says the old dude sure this book was from 1867. Now, I'm sure most of you are aware. But if you aren't aware, Chicago had this massive fire that basically decimated the entire city in 1870. This is a really rare find, and when I tell my wife, she gets all giddy and says we should try to find a collector to sell it to. I'm thinking the only place that would want this is a museum, but when she leaves, I start flipping through it. I check out the table of contents, and there's parts on this thing called Avocado's Constant, Periodic Law, Science Mumbo Jumbo. I think he meant Avogadro. I keep this book in my safe. Go through the others and they're mostly from the 1950s or the 1930s. And I went to bed. Sunday goes by pretty smoothly. Grill some burgers in the back with the neighbors. On Monday, I get a call from my boss at 6 and he's nervous. He says that there's some guys in suits here and they say they're with the FBI. Now, I'm not immediately freaked out because I haven't done anything wrong. He starts saying real quietly that they're acting kind of weird. Interviewing all the inspectors one by one and they commandeered his office to do it in privacy. I figured that this has to be about that big hole and he tells me that I should come by and just be cooperative. There's some conversation off the phone happening and he says he's putting me on with one of the officers. This guy with a pleasant voice comes on the phone. He tells me real normally that they just need to get some information about the place from what we saw when we were working on the place. Tell him I'll be there soon. And that's when I go to my office and get that weird notebook with the cursive in it from earlier. I just decided to leave it at home and if it really is something important. Then I'll just hand it over if they ask for it. Get ready, head to work. When I show up, my boss meets me outside and is acting real paranoid. He's under the impression that they're looking for Russian spies. He obviously doesn't want to be the guy who employed a Russian spy. So he's just telling everyone to be super honest. I walk in and everyone's doing paperwork at their desks like normal. There's a line by the boss's office and this tall guy in a black suit ushering me to the line. Another shorter guy is writing down things on a clipboard, getting names and addresses and phone numbers. He's asking other stuff, too. Like date of birth, religious affiliation, relationship status. Weird things he probably doesn't need to know. I overheard him ask one guy his religious affiliation. And when he said atheist, he starts referencing this little handbook and asking different questions. Like have you noticed a number of stray animals around your home? And has your wife been acting lethargic recently? He even asks the guy if he's broken any dishware in the last week. And if he's had any random nosebleeds. And this is when he starts asking what the hell. The tall spook assures him that this is all entirely necessary. And that if he's uncomfortable answering that he can do it in the office when it's his turn. They ask me the basic questions and I give them basic answers and they pass over me. Just sort of tune out for a moment while I sit on one of the couches by the door. Start to doze off, actually fall asleep. Wake up to Bert and Ernie standing over me. They start grilling me about if I've been feeling lethargic. If my wife has been feeling lethargic, etc. Bert is writing things down like a machine while Ernie asks the questions. They seem satisfied when I tell them I'm just tired. And they remind me to answer all of the questions truthfully in the office. My name gets called and one of my coworkers comes out of the office. He looks pissed and just goes to his desk. So, Bert and Ernie bring me to the room and shut the door. There's two guys in here. This balding old guy at the desk and another guy in the corner I didn't see at first. I'm gonna start by describing the other guy. Because when I turned around and looked at him, my mind started running through a few things. Things like the cruelty of God, the inequity of being, how some men are born to suffer. I remember thinking back to when I was a kid in Sunday school. This young girl with braids and a dress used to teach us about the Bible, about how God loves us all, about how we're all made in his image, stuff like that. Well, if we're all made in his image, then God for this guy is a seven foot tall cardboard box full of steel bricks. The sheer size of this lad.jpg. I go to say hi to him and he pulls out one of the chairs in front of my boss's desk. He thanks me for my time and asks me to please be seated. 
The old guy's turned around flipping through his clipboard, checking off a few things. He's got this long hair down to his collar crowned around the back of his head. But the top's totally bald, and I'm thinking this guy's got a lot of confidence to be walking around without a toupee. The shades to the two windows behind him are closed to where they're just letting in enough light and the desk lamp is on. Thank you very much for your cooperation, mister. I understand that this is all very odd for you all, and that we're wasting time for all of your work schedules. Please know that this is very important for the... He stops and looks through his little handbook. For our ongoing investigation, the city planning office contacted us about the building your group was inspecting last Thursday. He starts asking me about the foundation. If I noticed any cracks or structural damage. He's not immediately going on about the hole even though I'm sure he's trying to get into it. I ask him what he means and Boxman coughs a bit like he's stifling a laugh. I'm not the kind of guy to bullshit. So I just ask him if he's talking about the weird hole and the creepy cult things. The bald guy looks up at Boxman and asks him if he'll please allow us some privacy. Box dude has his eyebrow raised at me. But he quickly turns and leaves at Baldy's request. Okay, mister, you don't seem like the kind of man who wants to sit around bullshit back and forth. So let's just jump right into it then, shall we? The bald guy starts asking me a series of increasingly strange and invasive questions starting from how long I was in the storage room, if I'd found any documents pertaining to the group in question who was occupying the place, if I'd had any contact with any parties asking about my findings. And when I was last at the site, I slipped up here and said sat and he went. Oh, so you're the one who took the books in the front. Come clean to him about my little investigation. How Saul and I checked out the place. And I ask him if I'm in any trouble now. He starts saying, Oh, not at all. You're simply doing your job, I assume. Still, you shouldn't be working on weekends. It isn't good for you. Just continue with this line of dialogue. He and I have a back and forth about work. About mundane stuff like that. And he then coughs and says that he wants to ask me about the door in the back of the storage room. I stop him and let him know about the chains and padlocks and things we found on it. I'm glad this is back. Forgot about it. Hurry up, man. Really, I'm sorry about all of this. I'm actually applying to become a military officer and I've got that to deal with on top of this case I'm working on. So this is kind of on the back burner for me. My cousin also just called earlier with more info. But nothing new. He says he's talking with the guards that he's cool with to check in with the old man. Because they're also in on the whole story and they're vaguely interested. Not sure if they can speed up the thing with the old man. But I passed off some questions that may go down the pipeline to the old dude while he's in the hole. I don't mention the Latin and he didn't seem to mention anything about it. He asks about if I'd trashed the books yet and I tell him no. He requests that I bring them in immediately after our meeting. And then he goes on with other questions. This is weird because most of these sound like stuff a doctor would ask. Asking me what sort of food I've been eating. If I've noticed any heart palpitations or trouble breathing or anything like that. He asks if I've had any bouts of rage, no. He asks if I've had trouble sleeping, no. He asks if I've woken up in random places around my house, seemingly losing time, and no. I answer them normally and then he warns me that he's going to ask some very personal questions now. He tells me to let him know if I'm uncomfortable and I just tell him it's fine. He rattles off my address. And I try to ask him about how big this investigation goes or what it's even about. He just asks me to answer all of the questions and we'll get to that. He starts asking really weird questions now. Like, Have you noticed any uncommon faces around your neighborhood? New neighbors, cars you don't usually see, joggers or people around the place that seem unusual? I ask unusual how. His answer is disproportional. Like, what does he mean by disproportional? He elaborates by saying something like, We're looking for people who have been affected by radiation and the effects of the situation in question may have affected them in ways like long hair, abnormally long arms and fingers, jagged, abnormally long teeth, hunchback, those sorts of characteristics. I tell him I've never seen someone like that in my life. Then he starts asking about my wife, if she's had abnormal behavior, if she's made any comments about her health. I tell him that I don't want my wife involved in this and he assures me that it's all for the sake of the investigation and that this information is crucial. I reluctantly answer with no to just about everything. She's acting fine. He concludes the whole interview. He and I walk out together and he brings Bert and Ernie over and asks them to bring me home to collect the books. They've got this black Mercedes out in the front with black license plates and we get in and I take them to my house. 
while we're driving there. I start bullshitting with them about their lives, families, stuff like that. The tall one, Bert, isn't saying a word, but Ernie's driving and he's talking like a pretty amicable person, starting to get a little less tense around these guys. They seem pretty normal, but Ernie doesn't give me any real answers to my questions. He does flag one thing with me, because I ask him about the whole radiation thing and the people they're looking for. He turns to Bert and is like radiation. Bert coughs and he's like, Oh, yeah, yeah, it's some real classified stuff, man. I can't say too much about it, but be careful. If you see anyone weird like that, you just lock your door and contact us and we'll handle it. He hands me a black card with nothing but a phone number on it. When I get home, my wife is obviously already a little nervous. And she comes out to talk to me. But she shuts up when she sees Bert and Ernie. We're going in the front door and Bert and Ernie try to come with us. But I ask them to please excuse us and to wait out front for the books. Ernie says all right, but not to take too long. And Bert's already pulling out a pack of cigarettes. Now, I get in and my wife is freaked out. She says she woke up after I left because she heard the grill creaking. When she went to the window, there was this tall, lanky man in a hoodie with the hood up going through our stuff in the back. She called the police and hid in the bathroom. They'd already left by the time I came up with Bert and Ernie and I asked her some of the same questions that the bald guy was asking me. Apparently they couldn't find anything and just told her to call again if anything happens. She says she couldn't tell about the hunchback part, but the guy's arms were long and skinny. Like the arms of the hoodie only came up over his elbows and the rest was just sticking out like a tree limb. She says he was practically walking on his hands and I get freaked out and go to tell Bert and Ernie. Now we let them in and they immediately go to the back. I show them the grill and when they open it, nothing's in there, but the two of them are looking at the inside roof of the thing. I look in there, too, and it looks like someone's been wiping their fingers in the thing. Someone scooped the fat from the burgers the other day out from the base of the grill. Some of it's also dripped onto the floor. I also notice this weird, spotty handprint by the grill on the ground. Then they start looking around the house. While they're gone, I check in the roof of the grill and there's another one of those spiral things wiped into the black on the top. I hear my wife talking with Ernie in the house, but I can't find Bert. I hear a stomping sound above me and they tell me he's searching my attic. Excuse me. He comes down and just says negative. Ernie sort of sighs and he says they need to report this. I tell my wife to stay with the neighbors until I get back. We help them bring the books to their Mercedes and they bring me back to the office. Before I go. My wife tells me privately that the photo place called and said that I need to come pick up my photos soon. When we get there, they bring me back to my boss office and we explain the situation to the bald guy. Box man says oh, like that means something bad. I'm getting freaked out now and I'm demanding answers. Like, if this whole radiation thing is spread around the town, and if I should consider moving. Baldy puts his hand to his mouth for a few moments. He asks me to leave for a moment for privacy. And Ernie brings me to the couch. I'm almost entirely sure he was watching me to make sure I wasn't listening to them. Everyone in the office is working again. And I can see some of them looking at me. We're drawing a lot of suspicion. And when my boss goes to talk to Ernie, I overhear him telling him that I'm a possible victim, not a suspect, in the case. I hear him say something about witness protection and my boss walks off. Ernie talks with me about if I'm concealing anything. And that for my own safety that I need to be honest. Tell him everything I know but I leave out the old chemistry book and the journal I found. He just shakes his head and says there's nothing to go off of with that. We get called back into the office by Boxman. Boxman looks tense. And the bald guy is going through a little notebook with Bert. The two of them are talking real low. Saying could be that one, yeah, it's pretty common, not normal behavior. Baldy looks up at me and says that their investigation is pointing at me for a lot of evidence. He explains that he wants to put my wife in protective custody. I really don't like the idea. But considering everything, I agree and ask where they're gonna have us. He corrects me and says that they specifically just want my wife. Not me. They say that it'd be best for her safety. But that I specifically would be a crucial part of this whole thing. What the hell? They tell me they'll be providing me compensation for my work days missed and that everything can go back to normal when they conclude their operation. I keep complaining about how I'm really uncomfortable with this but they assure me that I'll be allowed phone calls with her whenever I want. I'm let out early from work and they tell me to just go home and prepare my wife for a stay at a hotel. 
They said they were going to wrap up there and do some paperwork at their own office. And that they'll come by tomorrow morning. Hop in my truck and head home. On my way back, I run by the photo place and pick up the photos. It's sort of a big packet. A little thick. The woman at the counter is looking at me funny and asks if I'm working on a movie set or something. Says she almost called the police over these pictures. I tell her that, yes. I am indeed working for Universal and that they're shooting a movie here and I leave with the packet. She gets all giddy and asks me more. But I tell her I really have to go. Oh snap bump I have a feeling this whole story has something to do with the murder of his wife and the drawings. Otherwise why would he be able to give so much info on it if he doesn't talk about much else? He has these weird bouts of being lucid and normal. They've known the guy for like 8 years and they're only going over this now because he's been sharing more about it recently. Originally. It was all jumbled and they couldn't piece enough of it together to even know if he was telling the truth. People used to think he was just this weird old guy who honestly should be in a mental ward. My cousin started asking about what he did know, though. And the old guy started correcting him on stuff. And then adding new stuff. The picture part is new, though. Originally. They knew about the camera thing. And he only went off about picking up the pictures a few months ago in the long, weird bout of normalcy. I get home and pick up my wife from Dale's place. They start asking about stuff but I make up this thing and say I can't talk about it. Calm my wife down when we get in and explain everything. She's actually okay with it because she'll be away from the house for a while. But she doesn't like being away from me. She goes back to the bedroom and starts packing. And I go to the office. I open up the packet and start going through the photos. First one of the first rooms. There's a lot of guys in respirators and suits, and they're definitely packing. Some of them have guns out and are checking the other rooms. One photo is of that closet that was full of the spirals. And there's a bag on the ground. The next photo has that bald guy in it. And he's got a big bat in front of the spiral closet. Photo has the contents of the bag on top of it. And it's some strange tool things. How did I not find this? There's this thing that looks like a really big back scratcher with a long handle on it. The next tool is like a big walking stick. But it's got this spiral thing at the tip tack curves off at the top, sort of looks like a candle light. The third and last tool is a big, sharp dagger with some rust on it. With a curved handle. Next picks are of the other rooms. After that. There's this weird, out of place picture of two men standing at attention like soldiers. They've got rifles and some other equipment. And they're wearing gas masks and helmets. They're also wearing these old-timey, slightly tarnished chest plates with some words carved into them. Next photo has them crawling down into the hole. And I can see the ladder there and some guys in suits standing around the hole talking. Next picture is from behind them in that brick tunnel, pointing their guns down the corridor with flashlights on them. There's pictures of the brick wall. Some of the bricks are offset and weird, bigger than the others and square. They've got different carvings in them. Like one has this hexagon with a spiral in it. And another is a trapezoid with a few zigzags in it that makes it look like it has teeth. There's a picture of where I assume the end of the tunnel is. Whereas opens up to this larger room with a couple pillars in front of an old, metal door covered in rust. Both pillars have big stones in them. With what looks like an angel or something holding out a vase and looking down. There's this big triangle carved into the door pointing up. The next picture is of a guy in a robe and a gas mask throwing something at the door. But I can't tell what it is. Picture after that is of the robe guy entering the room. But it's too dark in there to see what's going on. I definitely don't have it. But he mentioned something about 26 Street Woods. Maybe that'll help you out. But I doubt it considering they probably knocked the place down ages ago. He said he went back after a few months and the place was marked derelict building and it looked like they were prepping to tear it down. Next picture looks like it's inside the room. It's really, really big. And the next picture is pointing up and it just keeps going up like it never stops. And it's too dark and far for the flash to reach the ceiling. I'm starting to think that tunnel must have led them down a real long way because this basement wasn't that far underground. The next picture is of the floor. And there's a lot of drawings all forming a bunch of curving lines toward the center. There's a big pedestal that looks like a vase in the center. And it's got it carved into it, too. Then there's this metal box on the pedestal. There's another picture of the robe dude and the soldiers standing side by side in the room. I can see one gas mask guy in the back who looks exactly like the bald guy from earlier. Examining the box on the pedestal. The next picture makes me stand up because it's the big double doors we opened with the spiral carved into the wall in it. 
but there's no wall back there. The door actually leads somewhere now. The next pictures are from inside the room. The walls look like tree bark, and they stretch up into this sort of peak at the top like a roof. In the picture, there's the bald guy pointing at the walls and directing several other soldier guys who are walking in his direction. The next picture is of that rogue guy with the mask. And it's of his back as the other soldiers follow him into this wood tunnel thing. He's holding up this big stick thing in front of him. The next few pictures are weird. And I'm thinking it's stuff they dragged out of the tunnel. There's a full suit of armor. And a lot of it is black and brown from rust. Like, a real suit of armor. Knights fighting dragons kind of suit of armor. The helmet is still intact. And there's some weird insignia on the body plate that looks like a bird. Then there are spears, swords, some other helmets, things like that. There's two scrolls in the right side of the photo, next to the weapons, and a torn up old book. The final picture has this weird mask in it, with a face that's way too big, like those wooden masks from Africa. And it's got this creepy smile design on it. It's entirely white, with the exception of some dirt, but it looks like they'd already cleaned it off mostly. There's a big robe next to it, and a huge, silver rod. Beside all of this is this really weird skeleton. Most of it's broken up and pieces are missing. But I can clearly see that the spine is bent and sort of strange. The ribs jut upwards from the spine and stick out way too far. And there's an arm beside the torso that has this big bone that's kind of short. And this really, really long forearm bit that's broken in the middle. The hand bones are just as big as the forearm. And they're long and lanky. There's also a skull that's sitting beside the mask. And the thing's massive. The jaw was huge, and the cranium was even bigger. Though it sort of looked like a person. I know it doesn't make sense. But he described more about when he actually went back there and it weirds me out. Fantastical shit. You know. The doctor says he refused to talk about when his wife went with them. Says it breaks him up inside and he gets pouty. This is the first story he kept trying to tell people and it always put them off. He kept telling it to the doctor guy. So here's how he related it to my cousin. This was probably a few days after his wife left with them. He keeps saying that they took his stuff. And I'm assuming he means the pictures and the notebook and everything. Like they took all the stuff I had on them. Thinking about how serious those pictures are. There's no way they wouldn't know that he took them. I don't really know how he got here. But he says he had to know, he had to know. I'm also assuming it was night time. Sorry, boys. But you'll have to wait a second on this next part. It's on another notepad around here that I was taking a couple months ago. I've gone through a lot of trouble trying to get a chronological story out of this. So don't blame me if some of this stuff sounds disjointed. Or alternatively if it sounds too accurate. I know it's too accurate. I'm putting these notes together as a coherent story. I didn't think I'd get anyone reading this. But now that I've got a proper thread going about this thing. I think the more unbelievable portion is okay to tell now. On a side note, I'm trying to draw that weird spiral thing that the old man is drawing. My cousin's seen him doing it. And he's really, really precise with how he does it. Like, his hands are usually shaky. But when he draws these things, it's like watching someone work on a sculpture. When I started this thread, I had actually asked him to send me a rough sketch of the thing, but I don't think I'm gonna get it. I'll go visit him tomorrow if it makes a difference because I do want to make sure he's alright with that rip. If the thread dies, look for an old prisoner part 2. I'm pretty stoked about the fact that people actually care about this. I was worried I'd just get a bunch of people complaining about skinwalkers and things like that. So, I found the notes and I've started compiling them into a first-person narrative. This was from back when he was a bit less talkative. So this is just an odd interest my cousin and I were using to carry on a conversation and pass the time so he wouldn't have to go back to his cell. He was in the cell right next to these guys and he'd have conversations with the doctor. Because hey, what are you gonna do when you've got years to just sit around and bullshit, right? Anyway, it starts off with my cousin asking him why Twitchy acts so funny all the time, being an older guy. The doc sort of took my cousin under his wing, and the old man was always with them because, you know, safety in numbers. There's other guys, too. But they're not really important here. I'll name them if I have to as the story goes on. Given his strange behavior, I can imagine that he took up a lot of their conversations, but it's not like anyone tried to hurt the guy. So, the doctor keeps telling him that the old man's a lost cause. 
It keeps mumbling about being lost in trees and shit like that. Originally. The doctor immediately said that's why you don't do drugs. But he tells my cousin that as time went on and he got to know the guy, he realized that he's just scared. He's just a scared old man who wants his old life back. But they didn't know what that old life was. Sometimes, he'd come up and solve problems. Like mechanical problems if you get me. Maybe a shower head wouldn't work. And he'd go and mess with it for a bit and it'd be just fine. Or, someone would need a cigarette. And he'd just have it, out of nowhere. Nobody visited him. Nobody talked to him, he'd just solve problems. They knew he was a good guy at heart, just a little screwed up. Wouldn't say where he got some of this from. But they all assumed that the guards gave him things out of pity. My cousin is really the reason he's been getting better because before him, nobody talked to the guy. So, one day, at the lunch table, my cousin asks him why he eats his mashed potatoes last. Weird question, right? Well, he tells him my wife used to make them for me. The doctor drops his spoon and just looks at him in awe that he just had a normal human interaction. They ended up pulling more and more out of him. Just simple questions at random intervals. But not too many questions. And not too complicated or you'd freak him out and he'd start throwing a fit. They figured out he was a building inspector because they were talking about the cracks in the floor and he goes moisture. They start digging with this one. And out of nowhere he just goes. Well, moisture buildup in the foundation of the building can make it give way to movement in the surrounding earth. Longest sentence they'd ever gotten out of him at this point. I decided to start writing this down. Because I was working with a charity thing to help mentally challenged kids in high school. Also, like I said earlier, maybe I could use this as a story to, I don't know, make a report and get a job, or get into college because, hey look I helped the mentally challenged in a prison. Give me accolades and shower me with praise. It slowly became a thing about figuring out his story when he opened up about the spirals. Whenever he'd draw them, he'd just shut up and focus on it. Mumbling this too low for people to hear. And they were afraid of him when he'd get like this because the doctor says he'd actually jumped up once and knocked someone's jaw out of place for messing with him while he did this. One day, my cousin tries his luck, and he asks him real nicely what the circle things he's drawing are for. He tells him another place. He keeps trying this with him and one day he just drops a piece of chalk he was messing with and just sighs and looks at him. He tells him, You don't get it, it's the trees. You wouldn't get it. So, he keeps it up. He starts asking what he means about trees and he just looks up and screams at him. It's because I have to know. Every weekend, if I could, I'd come in and get more information from my cousin, and every weekend, the old guy guy became more and more lucid and talkative. Sometimes, he'd talk about finding old tunnels. One time he even talked about how he found this pile of carcasses under the floorboards of a house. He talked, he told stories. Normal things, but in a not normal way sooner or later. They'd even gotten him to laugh again. First time the doc ever heard him laugh. Anyway, one night, my cousin's up late. His cellmate was taken to the hole. And he's there all alone. This time, the old guy initiates the conversation. He tells him that he was lost in the forest in another place underground. At first, he thought the old guy was talking to himself. So my cousin is like what the hell, and the old guy turns out to be talking to him. And he says that yeah, he went to another place and he got lost. He was scared because he didn't know if he'd ever leave, but he escaped. He says he hates it here and he's ready to go back there now. And he'll even take him and the doctor and the other guys if they're ready. This sort of weirds my cousin out, but he plays along and tells him yeah. Why not? How do you get there? This is where he began exploring the stories. It's where he began putting this into a chronological order. But he had to sort of do it backwards and just buy all the bullshit. For example, he'd talk about how he originally got in there through the basement. And the natural question was what basement? Then he mentioned the building and he'd say what building? Why were you there? As things got more lucid, he realized that this might not be entirely bullshitting and maybe he actually believes this. The doctor was listening the entire time. And the next morning they start talking about how this might be something in his head. And they might be able to sort of walk him back into the real world by going through all this with him. Of course, it didn't work that way. The more they learned about this stuff, and the more they learned about him and the man he was and what had happened to him, the more they started to buy into his things. It's not like he had them drawing spirals everywhere or whatever. But he had this uncanny knowledge of chemicals and reactions that the doctor could back up. Some of it. Not all of it. 
and sometimes the doc would call it bullshit and the old guy would go. If we had the chemicals here, I could show you. I could do it in the forest. When the doctor asked him to elaborate, he'd start drawing again. But not drawing spirals, he'd be drawing these circles with circles in the circles and weird drawings inside them. And he'd start mumbling about how, if you get the right chemicals in the right increments, you can get it to happen. Sometimes, you didn't even need chemicals. You just needed to get your math right and to work at the right time in the right way. One thing he would always refer to is that it's always the right time in the other place. At first, my cousin wouldn't even talk to me about this. The doctor still thinks he's crazy. And he hasn't shown them an ounce of proof, but they like his stories so they keep letting him go on about it. Anyway, I'll be posting the story we pulled together about his time in the other place. This part's a lot more fantastical. Like I said before, and God only knows what he's making up and what he's telling the truth about. He only began explaining his life before he entered the basement recently. And it took years of working backwards from the other place for them to get him to do this. So, I'm gonna take it from where I left off. After they took her away, I was alone. The bald guy called me out about the film and he demanded that I give it back to them. I just handed over the photos as quickly as I could and they started talking about how they should lock me up for impeding an investigation. They sat me down and started going through more questions, asking me what I thought of the photos. Why I would do that, they were really mad about the photos. Arnie tried to make up something about these photos being linked to the crime they were investigating, but I knew it was bull. Bert went back to my office and went through my stuff. After everything they started acting all nice. They told me to make sure I locked the doors. They really made sure I knew that I had to lock the doors. And the windows. They asked if there were any firearms in the house. And I lied and told them no. Then, they told me to get one. With the flying. The bald guy left 500 bucks on my counter. And he specifically said handgun and rifle. Trust me, just get them. This is America. Friend. My wife left with them and that was it. She said she'd call the house when she made it to where they were taking her. I never got a call. They never gave me any information about where she was and how this protective custody thing would work out. They left without giving me a phone number to call her or them or anyone. I couldn't call the police or anyone about it. Of course, they told me that this needed to stay quiet if I wanted to ensure her safety. With nothing left to do. I hit the grocery store and got a bunch of beer. Finished, hit the liquor cabinet and didn't stop. I don't know, it got boring and my wife wasn't around, so why not? That's how the first night went. After drinking my nervousness away, I put myself down on the couch to watch the news. I sort of fell asleep, and I woke up to someone knocking on the door. I thought it was those suit guys and I stumbled off the couch to get the door. I tripped on the carpet and landed face first in the living room. I could see that Indian TV test thing across the screen while I was on the ground feeling bad for myself. I heard the door knock again. Started getting up and I heard one big knock. Actually, it sounded more like a thud than a knock. Then I hear someone messing with the doorknob. I got a little nervous and I called out to see who it was as I stumbled over to the door. I checked the peephole and nobody was there. I figured I should just go to bed and then I heard knocking again. Okay. This time I'm entirely certain that it was a series of thuds and not a knocking. Just yell who the hell is it. I checked the peephole and nobody was there. Figure it's some kids from down the street. I ended up going to bed. Sometimes, I'd hear knocking. And at one point I screamed that I was gonna shoot whoever was doing that and it stopped. In the morning. I went out to check for clues or anything. I was hungover so it seemed like the rational thing to do. There wasn't anything there. My neighbor came by later and asked if I was having anyone over. Tell him no. Make up something about the wife being on vacation. He says his wife has trouble sleeping. She sometimes watches the street to help her sleep and she saw some tall guy knocking on my door at 3 in the morning. He says the guy ran through my yard and down the street. I went to an army surplus store and picked up a Springfield rifle. For the rest of the day, I just pace around, worrying about my wife. I go into my safe from my handgun just in case and then I remember the journal from the basement. It's sitting in there with that one book on chemistry and transmutation. I still can't read this. The chemistry book is written normally though. But the phrasing and all that is super outdated. I figure the cursive journal would be quicker to read and would offer quick answers. So I take the gun and the journal in my truck and head to a bookstore. Put the handgun in the glove compartment and bring the book inside. 
I asked the woman at the desk for help and I made up how this was a deceased family member's journal about chemistry. The woman at the help desk says that she could translate it, but I'd have to pay her a fee. And she suggests that I just learn cursive and she sells me on a kid's cursive book. I didn't think embarrassment was possible in a bookstore. So, I take it back home and I begin to learn cursive. The first page is a good start. It's just one little paragraph, pretty faded but legible. I started with T and realized that I was wrong and that it was completely illegible. As I began writing this out on another sheet of paper, it started making more sense and I felt worse and worse about this journal. He may have been drunk on hooch for this part, but my cousin says he put his hand to his heart and recited lines that went something like, For my dearest Igraine, you are the most wonderful gift God has ever granted me in my meager and tiring life. You broke the chains that shackled me to the stone beneath my feet. You gave new breath to my pain of worldly existence, and delivered me from the rot of the mortal being, which is why I am lost without you. You brought me to your hidden grove in your far corner of Avalon, but without you, its magic is long gone. Our sacred roots have run dry, and the fruits of your love are tainted with that rot. Restarting this thread's gonna be a pain. So I'll take it from where I left off and I'll leave the compiling to the archive guys. I'll take it from where I left off. Old dude got back to General Pop after a few hours. I came in around that time, and my cousin said he was discussing something with that doctor from earlier. He was saying that he needs a team of people who have that spark. He went on real low like we can do this. But we need some younger guys, too. How about the kid? The kid's got it. I know, the doc kept going you're full of it. You're full of it, and the old dude was saying they'll talk to you later. I already put your name in. The last thing he said was the sprouts are showing again. It's almost ready. They'll show you. Apparently he came to talk to me right after and that's all he knows. Guys, my cousin is getting nervous. Weird shit has been happening around the place. Imagine trying to translate slang English into old-timey bullshit. And that's how I came up with the poem. I wrote out what I thought it was supposed to be. He confirmed it with yeah kinda like that. Anyway. The old guy's doing fine, but I think he's meeting with some suits or something. I don't know how long I'm gonna have contact here. But maybe they offered him a deal. After a couple days of going through this thing, I understand much more. There was a picture of a thing with that white mask on. And a big robe over it with some stylized thing draped around their neck like a priest. It's holding that rod thing I saw the guy with the robe and the gas mask using in the picture. The journal calls them the men of the bountiful garden. Nobody listens to the old man when he tries to teach them about the things he learned in the books. My cousin tried sometimes. And he had him drawing all kinds of crazy shit. And doing math problems. Whenever he messed up. Which he couldn't tell if he had or not. The old man would get all pissy and wipe his hand all over it to erase it. Like when they were drawing in the dirt outside. He'd mumble that's not how you make it. No, no, no. Are you trying to mess with them? So my cousin couldn't give my any information aside from the spiral circles they were drawing and what they looked like. Said one of them was way different. Sort of looked like a spider web. Another had these zigzags and two symmetrical lines in it. That's really all I could get out of him. He says that he tried it himself once and he shocked his hand, like when you slide your shoes on a carpet and touch someone, but it could have actually been static shock. So, one night I was transferring information from the journal again. I drew out this circle drawing they had in there and started working on the line of words underneath it. It was definitely in Latin. So I was mouthing it out as I wrote it and I noticed this burning smell come up. I started looking around the room and I poked my head out to check the kitchen and hadn't been cooking anything. So I knew the stove was off. When I turned around, there was smoke coming off my desk. There were some embers forming in the circle on the page. I immediately grabbed it and threw it in the sink just as it was catching fire. This just wowed me. So I tried drawing it again and nothing happened. Maybe I drew it wrong. So I did it again. I thought I smelled that burning smell again. But maybe it was just from earlier. I'm sitting there scratching my head about this and I got startled when the phone started going off. Hello, mister, are you there? What's happening? It was Ernie. I'm like nothing's happening. What the hell? You guys haven't contacted me in a full week what the hell? He tells me that it's all for safety reasons. But they picked up something from my house and they wanted to make sure one of those guys they're looking for wasn't there. What do you mean picking up? Are you people watching my house? I hear some chatter in the background. And I definitely heard that bald guy talking. We've installed radiation sensors in your backyard just to be safe. 
We're nowhere near you, but sometimes they go off and we wanted to make sure you were safe. Bullshit. They were here for like 10 minutes and then they left. I start asking about my wife and they let me talk to her. She sounds happy to hear from me and she says that she's fine and that she's been staying at this office. They've got a whole living arrangement for her and everything. And she doesn't even have to cook her own meals there. So. Now I'm a little more assured about this whole protective custody thing and I'm starting to believe in these suit guys again. I apologize to Ernie for being so upset with him and he tells me that he was a little unsettled that I hadn't contacted them yet. I ask him how the hell I was supposed to do that and he reminds me about that black card with the phone number on it. Oh, okay. I feel dumb now because I totally forgot about that. I start looking around for it and it slipped in this part of my wallet I never check. Now, I'm much more calm about the whole situation. I ask them where the monitors are or how they're gonna tell if one of those guys comes up here. He just says to trust them and that they'll know. So we end the call and that's that. I go out to the grill where I wiped off that spiral thing and it's still gone. Nothing in there. I check the entire yard. Nothing. I go around the side of the house where Bert and Ernie were when they were here first. There's the AC unit for the house and nothing else. Still nothing. I go to the back door and I hear something scuttle under the fence on the other side of the yard. It was probably just a raccoon now that I think about it. Well, I lock all my doors and go back to my office and I remember Ernie going through my bookshelf. At first, I don't find anything, but then I remember him crouching down so I feel under the shelves. There's this weird sort of broken wood feeling under one of the shelves so I check it out. Go down there with a flashlight. It's another circle with a spiral thing in it, but this one has two twisted lines and this large circle in the middle that makes it look like an eyeball. That was my immediate idea of the thing. Sort of a twisty eyeball. So I'm putting it together in my head and the idea of this shit is creeping me out. I put duct tape over it and go to bed. I wake up at about 5 and decide that I'm gonna go check out that place again. With the tunnels in the basement. I pick up my copy of the journal and lock the original journal and the chemistry book in the safe. It looks like it rained last night. I start towards my car when I notice some big handprints in the drops on my car. I'm severely creeped out now and I just get in and do what I set out to do. The place is still there. But there's a big truck with some of the rubble and junk from inside in the bed. The door is now shut off with boards and shit. Labeled Condemned Building. I felt really compelled to go inside despite the warning signs. So go back to the truck and leave my handgun in the glove compartment and get my flashlight. I'd rather not get a firearms possession charge on top of trespassing. Just in care. You know. I can't find any way in, but the adjacent building is boarded up and there's a window on the second floor that I can get to. I climb up on a dumpster into the balcony and make my way in and the rain starts going back up again. This place is whitewashed already, but there's still some nails and construction shit sitting around. Head down the stairs and into the lobby. And that tunnel from earlier is there. From here. The door to the cult shelter should be on my left, or my right. I didn't know at this point. It isn't there. Like, it's just gone. No sign of the door. It's just completely vanished. I go up and down the walls and it's just completely gone. So. I start knocking on the concrete where it should be. I go all over the left wall and there's nothing. So. I move on to the right wall. It sounds hard, like nothing's there. But at one point I hear a hollow noise. I knock it again and there's definitely a hollow sound there. I check out my surrounding area and, still... There's nothing. But there is a big pickaxe by that construction table over there. I give the hollow point a knock and start going to work. Layer of concrete comes down pretty quick. The opening rooms empty aside from the old. Wooden desk. But the desk has all this electrical shit on it. There's a generator by the desk and when I hit it, tons of lights come on all over the place. Wires everywhere. And a lot of them are coming from the shit on the old desk. It looks like one of those old plug board things they used to use before phones worked normally. Gas masks hanging from the wall. And all sorts of new books on this little half shelf. There's also two phones. One on the wall and one on the desk connected to that plug board. Someone's definitely hanging around here. The bathroom's got a new door on it. I go in and the place has been redone. At first, I think it's some kind of drug lab. But it's this full-on chemistry lab with a huge shelf full of jars. Mercury, magnesium, cobalt, lead, all sorts of elements. Then there was a section labeled chemicals. Acetone, nitric acid, calamine, 
Christ, there's even an emergency shower in this place. Who's using all of this? I step out into the meeting room area where the chairs and the podium were and I can't believe what I'm seeing. The entire room is now has this big, circular table set up in the middle with chairs and everything. It looks like some kind of battlefield HQ where all the commanders set up stuff. There's a massive map on the table. Most of it's blank but I can tell they've been drawing all over it. It says entry point at this door icon in the center. And a tunnel system that branches out everywhere. Some of the branches are colored darker. And I'm assuming that means they're lower? Maybe, it seems like it. There's no key so I'm just winging this. I don't see any indication that the branches go up or anything. Maybe it only goes down. What's weird is that the branches extend back behind the entry point. Which I'm assuming is the big metal door. Like, immediately behind the entry point. They branch off, sometimes they intersect. It's like the map of a cave. I start checking out everything and that spiral from behind the podium is gone now. Looks like they had to break the concrete on it and they've filled that in with concrete to recreate the wall. There's another phone that's connected to the wires leading back to the plug board. But the main wire leads along the ceiling into the storage room. What the hell? When I follow the main wire with my eyes, I look up at the ceiling and it is entirely decked out with all sorts of writing and characters. It comes into the center with this circle thing. And it's got these branches that connect it to other circles with weird shit scribbled all over them. It's like an entire constellation of runes and writing that I can't understand. Then, I get a look at the back wall where the beds were and there's locked cases full of weapons. Not like swords, but assault rifles, shotguns, ammunition. There's a separate case that says silver ammunition, please conserve. I can see some shotgun shells lying in there and they've got blue casings. How did these people even getting funding for silver ammunition? The storage room has gone through an upgrade. There's another generator with some gas cans near it. And it's big. That main wire went to a light system that lit up the whole place. The hole's been repaired around the edges. But it's still there. It's got this big metal grate over it now. The wall's got a bunch of computers and all sorts of plug boards everywhere. They're hooked up to a separate generator and it's big. Bunch of gas cans by it but it's a safe distance from the equipment. The metal bars are off the big door now, and they've been set aside in the corner. It's still chained up with those big chains and the locks. There's a bunch of equipment crowded together in front of the thing, but a good few meters away from it. There's some satellite dishes and some other stuff hooked up to it, and it's got tons of wires trailing back to the generator and the computers. There's also a lone desk standing just beside the door. Above the desk has a sign that says direct foot traffic away from operation base. There's a few binders with laminated pages on the desk. Start flipping through it. I'm gonna warn you here. I'm making up some of the jargon, but he talked about a binder full of interactions guides and information on things that they only reference in code. Operations manual. Do not engage keepers unless engaged. Refer to manual for formal greetings and interactions guide. Note, Interactions Guide only pertains to X1, X2, X5. Keepers, I feel a breeze on my face. And then I hear a strong gust of wind. It's rattling the door a bit, but it dies down. This thing definitely leads outside somewhere. I'm thinking that whenever they broke open that wall, there must have been a way outside behind it. I go toward the door and step back when I hear three loud boom sounds. In before boomer memes. Someone's knocking on the other side. Remember the assault weapons back there and I shut my mouth. Hear someone say hey, guys, hello. Keep quiet. Hey, they sent us from Camp 1B to ask for more batteries and gasoline. Are you there? Bang, bang, bang. We would also like cigarettes and possibly chocolate raisins. If that's possible, guys. Hardly breathing right now and I'm already slowly on my way toward the door. Another voice comes up. Check your watch, dumbass. They aren't there yet. They'll be in by daylight. They're probably at the main office right now. How should I know when daylight is? There is no daylight in here. And you guys made me trade my watch with those masked guy. It's not like it was your watch anyway. Yeah. John, I know it's not my watch, but it's useful. There's no way to tell time in here. More banging. Hello, don't you guys have someone watching the door or anything? Okay, hold on. They told me to draw this thing to get attention. I turn around and notice a big, square indent in the back wall by the door to the HQ room that I hadn't seen before. It's got another one of those spiral things in it. Really big. 
I can still hear those guys talking in there and I hear a couple ding sounds. I'm already in the front room by this point and climbing over the broken concrete by the door. I take the pickaxe back to the where it was and start up the stairs. When I get to the room I climbed in from, I can hear someone yellow, what the, from downstairs. I told Dale that it should have been thicker. Didn't I tell him to make the wall thicker? Climb out and drop from the balcony. Sprint to my truck and get home. It's still raining. And the whole time, all of this shit is just running around in my head and I'm freaking out. When I walked in the door, the phone was already ringing. Non, where the hell have you been? It's Ernie again. I tell him I'm sorry. I was drinking at this bar downtown and... I've been trying to get in contact with you for half an hour. We were about to have to drive all the way back there to check on you. Don't freak us out like that. Start chewing him out for not giving me standardized communication times. He starts backtracking. Apologizing for freaking out. He says it's just been a long day. Something broke at work today and one of the guys left the lights on or something. Awkward silence. Yeah, I bet they did. I get to talk to my wife for a bit. Bullshit about the bar that I didn't go to. She talks about how she's never eaten so much takeout in her life. They tell me they may have to go for another week, but not to inform my neighbors or anything for safety purposes. I start talking about how my neighbors probably think my wife has left me and they reassure me with this spiel about sacrifice being part and parcel with public safety. Bullshit about me being a hero. That sort of crap. I'm like yeah, whatever. And I almost hang up the phone when I check outside my front window by the door. Eyes, big, yellow eyes, looking back at me. I freak my absolute shit and throw the phone across the room. Something makes a loud squawk noise and waddles through my yard. I can hear the grass crunching. I hear Ernie freaking out. Asking what's going on, I don't give a shit. I run to my office and grab the Springfield rifle in the corner. My heart is racing. I rack the bolt back and load a bullet into the chamber. I'm just standing there in the living room. Staring at the door. Phone is just buzzing now. I hear a car come up to the driveway. Someone's knocking on the door. Saying that it's the FBI. The suit guys break down the door and they see me just standing there with the rifle. I'd been standing there for hours with my rifle. Just waiting. They calm me down, get a statement out of me. Box man is sitting on the couch away from me asking questions. Bert and Ernie are looking around the house. They say they haven't found anything. I can't remember what box guy was saying. But I remember being a little put off by how smart he sounded. I was scared and I just wanted my wife back so I could pick everything up and move to Florida. That's where she and I said we'd go one day. When we were old. Now, I'm considering the fact that they do get hit with bad weather and the building inspection jobs down there must be pretty lucrative. Of course, they reject this idea and they said that they need me here. That these people are obviously attracted to me for some reason. But when they finish up here, they'll hand her back and I can do whatever I want. Bert, for the first time ever, says something that they may want something here. They ask to look around and I just say yeah, sure. They check the house top to bottom. Our room, my office, our cupboards, under the sink, the backyard. Ernie asks me about if I've found any strange rocks or gems or anything. Says that if they have any strange markings or anything, then it could be the effects of radiation. Can you kids spell bullshit? Of course not. Thank Christ my safe is hidden in the floorboards in my office. Because I'm almost entirely certain they're talking about weird shit like that journal in your safe. Bert's even going through my attic again. I hear him stomping around. And then the stomping stops and I hear muffled yelling up there. Boxman gets up and goes to the attic stairs. Ernie asks me to exit the house with him. I swear. I hear Ernie saying something like back, back, get back in there. There's nobody up there with him. Where is the bald guy? I ask him this outside and he said their boss had extra work to do. Says he's got a side project with the rest of our team. Yeah, I bet he does. Boxman stays with me while Bert and Ernie go and report what happened. We start some awkward conversation. I'm sort of afraid he's gonna break the chair he's sitting in. I go to get a beer and he asks if it's alright if he gets himself a drink from the cabinet. Ew, sure why not? Can alcohol even affect a guy this big? Get back with a few bottles of Budweiser and... Oh, yeah. Of course he's got the Johnny Walker. More awkward conversation continues about the rain. The drinks, other shit. He gets about three glasses in and I'm worried it'll take the entire bottle to get him tipsy. I'm already done with the beer and I go to put them in the recycling bin. I'm in the kitchen and he says, I have a feeling you already know a little bit about what's going on here. Then I stop and I sort of look back at him and I tell him that I had a hunch. He says that he wishes Jeremy would stop talking so much and puts his face into his hand. 
I start saying that I just want things to be normal again. Considering all of my experience and how most cases like this go, the answer is no, your old life is over. That's when my stomach really sunk and I really lost everything, you know. There are some moments in your life where you really realize that things have changed. Things have changed. And you're caged into this now and things will never go back to how they used to be. Like when you're driving for the first time. Or when you get married. Or when you're going to work again for the 30th week in a row and you know. This is your life now. I hate to admit it. But I stood in front of the pantry and I cried. Boxman didn't say anything. I just heard him pouring another glass. I just cried. I thought I had everything figured out. That the world was so small. Barbecues on the weekends. Maybe some kids down the road. Work my ass off putting them through college. And then I can run off to Florida and live out my golden years on a boat. Boxman's name is Simon. He talks about how he was like me. But something happened and now he runs with the FBI. I tell him that I really doubt their FBI and he laughs. That story didn't get you, either, huh? Yeah, a lot of other people put things together, too. He explains that despite my doubts, they are with the federal government. He does mention that if I spread this around, that he'd break my neck himself and that was enough to shut me up. Football was on. He mentioned how he used to play. Got a college scholarship and everything. But he quit because he was obsessed with chemistry. He was a rich kid. He had every opportunity open to him. But the world of science fascinated him. Simon would just read and read and read. And one day he started asking questions. A little too many questions. His professors took an interest in the big guy. And he ended up working with them. Sometimes, he's teach the classes while they were out. He loved what he did. But one day, he asked the wrong question. And his professor gave him a book. I can't remember which one he said it was. But in this book, an entirely new world opened up to him. He stormed into the professor's office. He was confounded by the principles and he said that it was old nonsense. That it didn't make sense and that he was angry that the professor even recommended the subject to him. That it was all impossible. The professor just smiled at him and said you don't have any obligations after you get your master's. Do you? He tells the man that he's got a job secured with Dao when he graduates. He says to tell them to fuck off. And that there's a much more intellectually stimulating job for him if he's interested. He saw no worth in money. He had money and it brought him no happiness. And so he decided to follow through with the professor's strange offer. His parents were absolutely astonished. And ashamed, too. That's how he got to where he was now. Muscle for the suits, is how he put it. This part really touched some of the guys. Someone said that Boxman's a rich kid and the others told him to fuck off. Even some of the younger guys from other groups came by to listen. Real show of humanity, the younger guys, including my cousin, begged the old man to continue and he says, I'm in here for forever unless something spectacular happen in the future. So why not? My cousin says one white kid came up with a pill bottle full of whiskey and tells him that his guard buddy gave him some. And he thanks the kid. They share the drink, and he goes on. I fell asleep on the couch. Simon woke me up talking on the phone. I don't remember what he was saying, but he woke me up. Simon left that morning, and he thanked me. Like, a lot thanked me. He says I've brought him something of great importance. Valuable for a greater cause. Melodramatic prick. I tell him that I'm sorry about everything that happened and he said don't be. Once I tell Mr. Carmine everything. You might be coming along in a Brooks Brothers suit for our next operation. Okay. I said my stomach sank earlier. And but you know that feeling when you do something you think is good and now you're about to be punished for it. Multiply that by a thousand. I smile real big and wave him on and he takes the journal and the chemistry book to the Mercedes. When I close the door. I just put my back against the wall and sink. What have I done? On one hand, I'm sort of giddy. Because this is an exciting new experience. I might as well be an astronaut. But on the other hand, I recall how creepy this shit is and I'm terrified. This is way out of my league. Like, way out of my league. I don't even know who these guys are. I mean, I know who Simon is. But I don't know these people. He did tell me another thing about that Bert guy from earlier. He says be patient with him. He lost his wife and children. That's what's setting me on edge. This is really dangerous. I don't know what I'm dealing with but this is really dangerous. I love my wife. And I don't know if I can accept all this responsibility with her depending on me. I just start going over my notes about the journal. I'm stuck in a rut for a couple days. I called the number Ernie or Jeremy answers and I asked to talk with my wife. We have a conversation. Like an hour long. Can't remember what she said and it eats me up that I can't remember it. But I'm happy to hear her voice. The next morning, 
I wake up at around 8. Christ, these workless days are really screwing up my sleep schedule. I check the peephole and it's baldy with Simon and my wife is there. She comes in and hugs me. She runs around the house, just gawking at everything. She's a little upset at the fact that the dishes are piled up. Also she gets angry that I haven't shaved in about a month. Baldy sits me down and we talk. He said that he won't tell the others what they talked about. All he says is that he learned everything here. The sheer baldness of this man. Sign a few papers. Agree to everything. Because I really didn't have any choice. I even spilled my guts about breaking into the old basement. They were surprised, but not shocked. Bald dude says he needs to take back something he said now. But he's visibly happy. He says it's good to have a new recruit. Recruit. The gravity of all of this is setting in. The bald guy starts out the door and Simon puts his hand on my shoulder. He tells me with everything you've given us. I hope you don't regret your decision. This is something you can't take back. You understand. I just sort of nod my head. I feel like a kid again. In a lot of ways. He slips some money into my breast pocket and tells me that I should get a real suit, tailored and all. I get a suit tailored at Brooks Brothers like Simon said. Taylor asks what the occasion is. And I tell him I've got a job with the feds and I'm nervous. He changes his demeanor and does his work fast. As I leave, he tells me to keep us safe from those damn commis. I just give him a nod. He doesn't understand. But, I guess it's enough recognition. This is when I walked off into my new world. A few days go by and Simon comes by. Takes me to this place outside of town. He teaches me about shooting. Interspersed with some of the things I'll be dealing with. He teaches me a lot. To hold my breath out during the first shot. Some other shit. He apparently taught the kids all this in the in prison. God only knows how many killing machines he's let out into the world. I get a call from my boss and he's complaining that I haven't shown up. Tell him to just let me off. Some people will come by to clear up everything. He starts complaining at me that I can't talk to him like that. I get this gust of confidence. Like I'm the boss now. I am thick up to no dot jiff. Tell him that I'm no longer employed with the city. I'm a federal employee. Hang up. This is a fucking dream. When Simon comes by. I let him know about my boss and he makes a call on our phone. Tells me that he forgot about my old job and apologizes. My boss calls on another day and kisses ass. Top kick. Tell him whatever. Hang up. Simon keeps coming by. He says I'll be receiving paychecks from the government now. I really didn't even think about this. And I'm a bit ashamed that I didn't consider my house. My wife. Everything. He just tells me just do as you're told. Have bravery and God will work everything out for you. Like he said. God worked everything out and paychecks come in the mail. I've got a pretty good weekly salary now. I could move into a nice place out of this neighborhood now if I wanted to. I was on the way to my car. I sold the old truck and now I've got a shiny new caddy. Pull up to the office that Baldy was telling me about. Bert, or Robert, comes out and he's pissed. Tells me that I can't be blowing my cover like that. And to just stop at the Cadillac and lay low with the spending. Have they been watching my bank account? I step inside and I get a pretty nice greeting from everyone. Some of the guys in the cubicles are talking about how I'm the guy who found the papers. I feel like a celebrity. A lot of these office looking guys don't look happy. But whatever. I get brought back into an office and Mr. Carmine is watching this whole array of TV monitors. They tell me that Jeremy couldn't be here because he's at the operations HQ. My job is to just sit around the house and train more. Okay, just sort of go with it for a while. Get into shape and shit. My wife is definitely happy. I'm happy. Things are really looking up for me in the world. Simon keeps bringing me out to this plot of land out of town. Sometimes, in between the shooting practice and him forcing me to run around everywhere, he'll bring up chemistry. And he taught me to draw the circles. Most of the other guys had left by this point. But my cousin stayed to listen. He said that they would be more reliable later. When we were on operations, I didn't know what he meant. But I just followed through. These guys gave me a new life. So I was indebted to them, and I just played along. He'd run with me, along the tree line. When I'd get tired, he'd say you have to have faith. Believe and things will fall into place. Sometimes, things would happen when he drew circles. He also made me read from the Bible a lot. I didn't think a centist would be so interested in religion. One time, during a cloudy day, he drew this circle with zigzags in it, and the entire area lit up with electricity. Pretty much everybody left at this point. Except the doctor and my cousin. Then came my first operation. I was brought back to the old basement. The door was walled off with concrete again. The place was alive. With people running communications from the phones. And men at all the plug boards. There were so many people there. There weren't enough chairs for everyone. There was even a jeep in the place. With supply crates in the back. I watched three men unchain the door. 
and when the other men grasped at it and dragged the doors open, I couldn't believe my eyes. The doors groaned open to reveal a tunnel of dark branches. Like in the picture, Mr. Carmine came by me and told me that this was all thanks to my discovery. I was assigned to a team of two. I was to take orders from my assigned officer. Michael, he introduced himself to me. Tall guy, he obviously knew what we were dealing with. So I relied on him for guidance. We were supposed to deliver supplies to Camp 1A. Michael assured me that everything would be fine. I still can't believe how quickly my entire life was ruined. Everything was lost. All of this preparation. The organized and tactical precision of everything. They had no idea what they were dealing with. No matter how well they had calculated everything. No matter how well we had documented these expeditions. Nothing could have prepared us. I was still useless with the circles. I couldn't even make a fire on my own. And they turned on me. I should have known. How could I have been so stupid? I just trusted them. I was just blindly following along. Like I knew they had control here. I'm fitted out with gear. Not with the usual suit. They outfitted me out like a soldier, kind of. Simon brought me in with jeans and a t-shirt. I mean it was the weekend. They said I probably wouldn't need it. But I was given a handgun with a holster. Then I was fitted with this chest rig of some ammunition clips. MREs. A canteen. A survival knife, one of those pocket multi-tool things. A flashlight and extra batteries were also provided. I was also given a rundown on keepers. I was shown pictures of them and they were these ugly-looking things. Definitely the guys with long arms and distended hands. I'd never seen the face before. And the one used in the chart had this massive face with an unhinged-looking jaw. I asked about the radiation and Mr. Carmine said that was a bullshit story. They're just like that. Most of them wear their masks, though. Keepers were largely harmless. They said, largely harmless. That didn't necessarily mean friendly. They're uncommon. But sometimes you'd find them wandering around the tunnels. They say they don't entirely understand why they're there. And communication is difficult because they don't speak. They communicate with one another in a sort of unspoken language. Or if they are talking, we can't hear them. They definitely communicate with one another in a complex way because they like to form groups or travel in pairs. But some might be wandering around on their own. They tell me that just like loners in human society, that I should be cautious of lone keepers. Sometimes you can hear them laugh, though. And they are capable of making noise. They also say they get out sometimes. And that some of them are good at using holes. They said that sizes vary from pygmy to massive. But the common size is about 8 feet tall. Even with the hunchback thing going on, this may be inconsequential. But I asked how they reproduce and I got a bunch of shrugs and some people laughing at the thought. My first trip into the tunnel was a little rushed. They said they were low on manpower and they really needed guys on the supply lines. This place was dark, really dark. As we continued away from the HQ, the branches along the walls separated a bit into trees and this tall, blue grass, the road became less desolate. And this blue sort of grass became more common as the road started to look more like a trail. With grass in the center and tire marks paving the way. Sometimes, I'd see tiny, little furry things jump out of the way of the jeep. They looked sort of like rabbits. But they crawled around like rats. We had to stop at one point because this big, skinny deer came out of the dense forest. It had these massive antlers glowing with a blue light. Kind of like how those glow in the dark toys glow except a little brighter. It came right up to the jeep, sniffed at it a bit. Its eyes were big, way bigger than they should have been, and pitch black. Michael started moving a bit and it went around us and down the trail toward the HQ. He said that those aren't usual, but they'd seen the deer before. As we continued, the roots separated above us and some moonlight was pouring in. Not enough light to turn off the headlights, but enough to get a better look around. We pulled up to a couple sandbag barriers with a fence gate. Two guys came up to talk with Michael and welcome us in. They let us in. And this was the first big clearing I'd ever seen in the tunnel. The giant roots and trees wrapped around this opening like a big wooden bubble. And there was some light coming in through an opening in the ceiling. It looked like a big military operation. But there weren't nearly enough guys for how big the place was. I'd say this camp had 10 or 12 people running the whole place. The ground got a little bumpy with roots which all converged in the center on this ruined old brick house that was overtaken with growth. There was another big satellite thing, pointed in the direction we came from. This is apparently how they've been communicating with the headquarters. The big, wooden sphere we were in had multiple entrances, and one that was much larger than the others and paved with rough, uneven stone bricks. I could hear a generator running from the house, but when we entered, 
The wires led down a stairwell into what I assume was a basement. This is where the other guys were taking a lot of the supply crates we brought them. The house looked like a little command center. But most of the beds were set up outside in tents that were constructed adjacent to the house. I met the guy who looked like he was in charge and he looked a little bored. I don't remember his name, but he had this slick, black hair. He thanks us for the gasoline and supplies and everything and sends us back to HQ. I went home and rinse and repeat. This went on for a while. And the camp at the big, wooden sphere got bigger and bigger. Now, there were more people hanging out around here. They even put together a little vehicle. And that would make trips down the dirt roads along he side to deliver supplies to other camps. One day, I tell my wife I'm going on this business trip because they say they need me down there for a full week. A full week. There's been an update. Mr. Carmine informs me in private that they've lost contact with their furthest camp. I haven't met any of these keepers yet. But someone who was sent to collect supplies from the camp says that they were getting an abnormal amount of them coming by the camp, snickering and sometimes pointing at them. He also mentions some bigger keepers, wearing huge, complex masks and more complicated garb. They seem to be leading the other ones, just wandering. These groups wouldn't communicate with them. They just snickered. This guy was sent back to Camp 1R and he didn't come back. They haven't had any communication since. Spoopy. I'm set up with a team of four as the documentation guy. When they open the doors to the tunnel, everybody stops and they're all sort of confused. Whereas usually, it's just a single tunnel. Now, there's an immediate pathway that splits off in the center into two tunnels. Our team is held up and they need to reorganize their strategy. They leave the doors open and I hear guys on the phones trying to make contact with Camp 1A. Apparently. They're getting a connection, but it isn't great. Camp 1A says they haven't noticed anything unusual. They send two scouting parties, one down each tunnel. The first one comes back a couple hours later and says that the layout of the tunnel has changed. They say that they came across a pair of keepers and they just sort of waved at them. They tried to communicate, but the other one didn't understand and they both walked away. They drove until they hit an intersection, and they didn't want to get lost so they came back. The other scouting group hasn't come back yet. Camp 1A says that they sent a team back down their usual route to make contact with HQ. And they came back saying that there's just a big stone wall there now. This isn't good because this camp needs supplies. While there are definitely water sources in the forest, and possibly food sources, these could be unreliable for a group of their size. This becomes a major issue and HQ starts working quickly to approximate their position based on their signal. More parties are sent in. Mostly to the tunnel that the scouting group came back from. This is where I get a lesson in how they activate these whole things. I don't know who, but they say they only have one member who knows how to activate them. But he's deep in the tunnels at Camp 1Q. Simon looks worried and he lets me know that this is the professor he was talking about. I start asking why would they would let their greatest asset go so deep into something so dangerous. He tells me that it was at his own request. And that the professor has more clout in the whole project so he just does what he wants. I'm starting to realize how disorganized this entire thing is. Now, we have a whole system of camps that can't get supplies. As the day progresses, people that we hadn't seen before are coming back. The original team's jeep got stuck in some routes and the rescue party had to tow them out. A scouting party comes back and says that they've made contact with Camp 1M. New parts of the tunnel are added to the map and I go in with a big party to document everything. Okay. I'm going to hurry this up and just get to the juicy bits. My internet is sort of fucking up again. I mentioned network issues earlier. The checks kept coming in the mail. I just sort of hung out at home for the next week. A full week and I get a few calls. I'm going to be part of a major expedition because they found the professor and he's onto something. On Wednesday, I got a call. It was Robert. He just said it's time. Come down to the office. I come up to the office and the whole parking lot is packed. But nobody's in the building. I start checking the cubicles and nobody's there. Simon comes out of nowhere and asks me to follow him into the office. He leads me into a supply closet and there's this stairwell in the back. We go down and it's the supply room. I was about to say something, but I stopped asking questions a long time ago. Everybody's suited up and they say they're waiting for some more people. I start suiting up, too. There's this really tall guy in a robe talking with Mr. Carmine in front of the tunnel. But it looks like the tunnel's still at that intersection with the two directions. As I'm getting suited up, Simon brings about ten more guys and one or two at a time through this big square indent where the spiral thing used to be. I go around the wall where the plug board is supposed to be and it's all still there. The guy at the desk asks me what I'm doing. Go to the other side of the wall and it's a stairwell that should be leading right into the desk. Okay, there's not much of an introduction. 
We're handed MREs and canteens, more water bottles on top of that than usual. They don't give us any weapons, surprisingly. Say they have the route under control. These guys on the jeeps are driving fast. We've got two in a line. We drive past Camp 1A. Then the next camp, then the next camp. Nobody's manning these camps. Some camps are manned, but it's only a few guys there. The guy next to me points out that they don't look like the normal soldiers. They've got gas masks and those chest plate things on that I saw in the pictures. And they don't talk to us, now that I think about it. All the suit guys have gas masks, too. None of us are wearing them. What's the point of it the gas masks? We stop for gas sometimes at the camps with the chest plate guys. How big is this place? As we drive over this grassy trail. The trees are thinning out and the light is pouring in. The sky is bright and blue. But still night time. I can see all the stars and everything. But the moon is absolutely massive. Like, cartoonishly big, and full. From this little clearing. I can see that we're heading toward this massive tree. The roots and trees get thicker and we're in the dark again. Decide to make small talk to pass the time. I asked the guy next to me how he got here. And he said just like everyone. Says he was was arrested in Vermont a few years ago for insurance fraud. I ask him what he did and he tells me. Probably the same thing you did. They had me in for life. You do the math. Now, I'm scared shitless. Are all these guys prisoners? Why are they using prisoners to do this? I thought they were all scientists or something. At Camp 1H. We stop to resupply and there's a lot more water here. We pass by two really big lakes. And sometimes, in the trees, I can see these big masks with teeth. Like, really, really big masks. The sound of this chattering laughter sort of comes out sometimes. I want off the ride. They drop us off in a place they call the outskirts. The floor is sort of tilted toward this massive sphere of roots in the center and curves all around. These roots are huge, and they're curling up all around us way up in the air. The grass looks like it's glowing bright blue. There's more of those chest plate guys with gas masks in here. And they've got guns. The jeeps get refueled and they say they'll be coming back with everyone. It takes a long, long time for the next group to show up. More of those soldiers with chest plates are showing up, too. At one point, we start feeling the ground shift. Like something big is stomping. Sometimes, I'll fall asleep in the grass. But the stomping wakes me up all the time. There's loads of these guys here. Well over a hundred. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time. Remember to check out the Odyssey page in the description for a second archive of the channel's videos.